Uh, Marcus, we're not. All right, I think we are. Are we? I don't see it on the YouTube page. Oh, there it goes. Now it's working. Okay. Okay, you both ready? All right. All right, we are. We are live, I think. Yep. Absolutely, we are live. All right. All right, let's do this. Yep. Hello and welcome to Explain Apologetics. Uh, my name is Ezra, and I'm part of the team here. And today, I'm the host for another historical debate on this channel. Now, today's debate is quite an interesting one, although it's basically Christian versus atheist. Uh, but there's a big twist. But uh, before that, I'd like to briefly introduce our two panels. Uh, first is Samuel Nason, who's not a stranger to us. Uh, Samuel, based in the U.S., he's the co-founder of Explain Apologetics and has sat down and debated key figures such as Matt Delahunty and David Wood. Uh, Samuel is from Malaysia, uh, but is based in Texas for his doctorate. And uh, our second panel, of course, is uh, another uh, person that is not a stranger to us as well as Tom Jump. Tom is an author, an outspoken atheist, and a philosopher, and has debated many, including Samuel himself. And in this case, uh, they're no strangers to each other. Uh, Tom also runs his own YouTube channel called T Jump, which features contents in science, religion, and atheism. Now, uh, like I said earlier, this debate is going to be different than the usual Christian versus atheist debate because uh, there's a big twist, and the big twist is they're shifting roles. Samuel is going to take up the role as an atheist, while Tom will take up the role as a Christian. In other words, they're playing devil's advocates of their own original beliefs. Um, and this idea basically comes from Sam. And Sam, could you explain to our viewers why in the world are you doing this? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, er uh, thanks very much. I I'm saying Eric because uh, I know Eric Hernandez is in the live chat. <laughs> uh, and shout out to Eric there uh, for this. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So basically, why we are doing this? Thanks, thanks very much, Tom, for for being on, and also thanks Ezra for do for moderating this. The reason I thought this would be fun is because uh, there's always this big question, and I remember the last time I debated Tom, uh, it one of the questions that came up is, "Can you steal man the other side?" Uh, and I think, I mean, I didn't answer that question. Randall answered that, uh, Dr. Randall Rausa answered that question. And uh, some people were not too happy with his answer, okay, to say the <laughs> least. Um, and uh, you can see Tom Jump smiling there. Uh, he knows what I'm talking about. But I wanted to see, it, can an atheist, uh, is it, an atheist like Tom Jump, who has regularly debated and engaged so many Christian apologists, is he able to accurately represent the Christian side? And am I, uh, as someone who, wants to engage atheism, am I actually able to uh, defend the atheistic position? Uh, and what I'm hoping is that to basically see whether we can actually represent the other side. But more than that, I'm also very interested to, uh, to hear what, what, for example, Tom would consider some of the strongest arguments if he were to defend uh, Christianity and also to share, for example, what I think are some of the strong arguments that uh, would I would use if I were an atheist as well. So this is going to be uh, maybe a, a, an eye opener for both sides to see where each other is coming from and, and where we can go from here. Great. Uh, if I'm to summarize what you said, it would be uh, first and foremost, whether uh, either you or Tom could represent it better. Uh, and second, to see uh, what's on each other's mind and, and do I get that right? I'm... Do I get that right, Sam? Yep, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Uh, so for our viewers, uh, if you just arrived here once again, welcome to Explain Apologetics. And my name is Ezra. I'm part of the team here, and I'm the host for this historical debate where we'll see Samuel, a Christian, playing a role of an atheist, while Tom, an atheist, playing a role as a Christian, explaining and defending the roles they're both playing. So in other words, can an atheist be a better Christian or can a Christian be a better atheist? We're gonna find out. And for our viewers, as a start, uh, we're gonna hear their openings, follow, uh, followed by re uh, rebuttals and cross-examinations. And later, they'll discuss how they would answer their own objections and other premises. 
at the end of this, we'll have a Q&A session uh, where we'll be taking questions from you. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them down in the chat box uh, by stating your questions and to whom you're addressing to it. And so how do you do it? Simple. Uh, write any of their names in a bracket. Uh, for instance, you have a question for Tom, uh, put Tom's name in a bracket and then uh, come up with a question. Uh, I repeat, a name in a bracket uh, followed by your question. And right now, uh, we're going to hear an opening speech from each panel, uh, beginning with Tom. And Tom, uh, you have seven minutes and the time starts as you begin to speak. And uh, over to you, Tom. All right, uh, thank, thanks, Ezra. Uh, thanks, Samuel, for inviting me on for this historic debate. I was paid a million dollars from the Templeton Foundation to convert to Christianity. It's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful experience for my bank account. So now I'm committed to defending the Christian faith with, with all of my being because I like money. Um, so to start off, uh, we know there has to be some necessary foundation to reality. Uh, there's, it's either going to be an infinite regress of things, a something that causes itself, causes sui, or just a brute fact of some kind. And the brute fact and the necessary thing would be synonymous in this case. So of those three things, an infinite regress doesn't seem to make a lot of intuitive sense, but uh, a necessary thing does. So, so is there some foundation to reality? It may or may not be conscious, but we know there is some foundation to reality. And it's possible that it is a conscious thing. And we know consciousness exists. We have lots of examples of consciousness. We can see things and we experience conscious experience, quality experience. And we presume that everyone around us has conscious experience. So we know consciousness is a thing in the universe. So it's plausible that we're, we're trying to account for what the necessary thing is, that we could use the parts of reality that we know exist and we've demonstrated to exist to try and explain that thing. And so one of the possibilities is that the consciousness that we experience could actually be the, a property of the fundamental part of reality. And so it's possible that this necessary thing that we know exists is in fact a conscious being. So that is the first step in realizing that there must be some of these properties of what we think of as the Christian God. Uh, at least there is a, a necessary being that is all powerful and it could be conscious. So those two properties are at least reasonable to assert about the fundamental nature of reality. It's, it's all powerful, created the universe, all contingent things came after it, and it could be conscious. Uh, why would we think the rest of the properties exist? Well, we believe in objective morality. We, we definitely have a feeling of objective morality. And this objective morality we have seems to have to do with beings. Morality is the principles that describe what we should do. And in order to account for an objective basis of morality, the best way to do that would be to have some kind of an objective standard. If we could say there is this objective standard of morality that we can compare our actions to, we can then give us an objective morality of saying our, our actions, if they correspond to the nature of this uh, being, whatever it is, then that can give us, tell us if the actions are good. And if they do not correspond to this being, then that can tell us if the actions are wrong. And so if there is this objective standard of perfection, then we can use that as a basis to create an objective model of morality. And it seems like if that thing is a being, then it's pretty easy for us to have our actions correspond to its nature. Whereas if it was not a being, it's much more difficult to try and account for how morality can be explained uh, by a non-conscious agent when morality seems to only be relevant to the conscious agent. So it would make more sense if the ultimate nature of reality was a conscious and had this moral property to it, which would explain our moral intuitions and moral progress. Um, also, there is sufficient evidence that Jesus of Nazareth existed as a human being. And there's quite a few accounts of miracles occurring or claims of miracles occurring that support that it's at least possible that he was, he did actually perform the miracles attested to. Um, we know that during the time period, most of the archaeological evidence supports the vast majority of the biblical accounts. And even though the, the most historians don't accept miracles as being supported by history, we can infer that it is at least possible. The accounts are not completely irrational. And there's many supporting accounts that if Christianity were true and miracles did happen, there are many accounts of people who are Christians who have had these experiences after the fact. And we offer an ability for you to test to make testable predictions. If Christianity is true and you open yourself up to the Christian God and pray to for forgiveness and enlightenment, then he will reveal himself to you. He will answer your prayers. And so you can do a testable prediction and it 
may work in your case. It may not, it doesn't seem to work in every case, but it can work in your case. And so that is something you can do to test this hypothesis. Another test for prediction is, well, after you die, you will meet God in heaven and be judged. So at that point, you will have sufficient evidence to whether or not God exists or not. So that's another basis of evidence of future prediction that Christianity can make. Other future predictions that we can make is that in Revelation, the Bible says many things about Revelation, about a chip in your hand, a mark on your forehead, um, certain kinds of prophecies about what's going to happen in the end times that are very specific. And so we can use those, if those occur in the future, that's a pretty good evidence that Christianity is true because it does make those predictions about the future. Uh, unfortunately, it's not very specific on the time frame. If it was, that would make it a lot more useful, but that does give us some basis to come to an evidential testable prediction that Christianity does make, and it makes quite a few of them. Um, other possible examples is we know that the DNA in a code is a code. DNA is a code. And the only codes we've ever seen made are made by humans. So it seems reasonable to infer, or my minds, and so it seems reasonable to infer that DNA as a code was also made by a mind. It's just a inductive argument of the fact that most of the codes we see are made by minds, or all of the codes we see are made by minds. DNA is a code, therefore it's reasonable to infer DNA is made by a mind rather than natural processes. Um, that gives us a good inductive basis to conclude that this code we see was made by a mind, which could be that of the God, and it would fit, and it would fit with the narrative of the, Christ, the Christian story and how life came about, if that were the case. So based on all these evidences I presented, it seems reasonable to infer that there is a God and that God could be the Christian God. Brilliant. You actually had extra one minute. And thank you so much for the opening speech. And now uh, we're passing this time over to Sam. Uh, Samuel, over to you, Samuel. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, it's really great to hear uh, how highly you regard Christianity. I'll be representing the atheist side um, and, uh, and basically presenting a case why I believe Christianity is not true. We can do this in two ways. First, uh, we can present evidences why we can demonstrate defeaters, why Christianity cannot possibly be true. And secondly, uh, we can also demonstrate that none of the arguments presented by my opponent today actually work. So in this way, we are presenting both a positive case against Christianity and also a negative case uh, against the arguments that have been raised. And I think if both uh, the contentions that I make hold true, it follows necessarily uh, that Christianity is false. Um, so let's start with uh, the most basic uh, of all assumptions of Christianity. I've noticed my opponent has uh, gone to some of the more basic arguments as to God's existence. Unfortunately, that's not a topic of today's debate. The topic is strictly Christianity, and I want to stick to the topic. How would one know Christianity is true? Let's start by the most fundamental claims of Christianity. Uh, well, fundamental to the Christian claims, if you study uh, ancient uh, Christian theologians, uh, such as St. Anselm, who famously came up with the argument that God was the greatest conceivable being. Uh, if God is the greatest conceivable being, and, and we, we, it's fair to say that God cannot undergo change. If God is the greatest conceivable being, God cannot undergo change. But we do see an inherent change when Christians believe Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, took on human flesh. So what that means is that God underwent change. And the argument can be phrased in this way, uh, in a simple way. Classical theism, number one, holds that God does not change and God cannot change because he transcends time altogether. Number two, uh, the Bible teaches us also that God does not change. For example, in Malachi 3, 6 and in James 1, 17. Number three, uh, the scripture, the Bible also teaches us that God, the son, became flesh and dwelt on the world, in the world, in John chapter 1, verse 14, and this involves a change from one state, not being human, to another state, being human. Further, the scripture teaches us that uh, God the Son died and rose again, Romans 1, verse 4, and this also entails change from the state of being dead to the state of being alive, and this ultimately means that the doctrines of the incarnation and resurrection contradict uh, what the Bible teaches, that God is both timeless and immutable, unchanging. So that itself inherently provides a contradictory claim. And as the basic law of non-contradiction goes, 
if something fundamentally contradicts itself, it cannot possibly be true. So that's the first defeater for Christianity. Second, uh, of course, is the fact that Christianity, uh, in, in its understanding of Jesus, and in fact, the, the very name Christ itself is a Greek rendering of the Hebrew Messiah, which means that Christianity draws from the Old Testament. But if you go to the Old Testament, you will struggle to find any trace of what modern Christians believe with the Old Testament. For example, the Old Testament involves practices such as uh, killing animals, uh, sacrificing them, uh, putting their blood uh, as a way of forgiving their sins. Now, we do know that Christians believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. But when you look and you see, you look at these two things. Christianity is not a continuation of the Old Testament. It's clearly different. Uh, when, when we examine some of the earliest heresies that came out, one of the earliest heresies that came out of Christianity was a heresy known as Martianism. Uh, and this came out in the late first century to, uh, towards the mid second century AD. Martianism was the first and most successful heresies uh, in early Christianity, and it gained such a large following for one simple reason. Martian demonstrated why the God of the Old Testament cannot possibly be the God of the New Testament. They're fundamentally different. The God of the Old Testament, argued Martian, was a God of anger, wrath, and genocidal, killing a lot of people. But the God of the New Testament demonstrates a lot of love, especially if you go to John chapter 8, was 1 to 11, you see Jesus and the story of the adulterous woman who says, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. The God of the Old Testament is not the same. If we, are ought, we ought to believe that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, then there exists a fundamental contradiction between both the Testaments and thus would be a natural defeater for Christianity. Finally, of course, apart from the fact that, uh, and I didn't get into the details, hopefully during the cross-examination, we can get into details as to the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New. The third and final argument, I would say that fundamentally uh, takes down any possibility of Christianity being true is the problem of evil and suffering. The problem of evil and suffering has often been pushed aside by Christian apologists when they try to present a case as if, uh, well, it's not a very strong objection after all. You find apologists like William Dane Craig brushing it aside and saying, well, the atheist has to demonstrate why this is such a strong objection. Well, actually we can do that. The Bible teaches that God is good. In fact, any understanding of God will involve the idea that God is the ultimate good. He is the standard of good. If God is the standard of good, God ought to be. It's highly improbable that God who is all good and all powerful, will be compatible with the evil and suffering we see in the world today. The fact that the God of the Bible not only endures, not only uh, is, is, is living, it's completely fine to live with the evil in the world, but is additionally, additionally, even said to decree evil. You, you read, for example, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse yeah, 7. Less than 50 seconds, Sam. In Isaiah chapter 45, 7, it says that God creates evil. And that's in the King James Version. We know some modern translations take a different take on that. But the point is, how do you reconcile that with a God who is maximally good? And unless you want to stretch definitions, it follows, I think, uh, that this, this is, and it ends up being one of the biggest defeaters for Christianity. If God truly, uh, I mean, if God is truly good, he ought to eradicate suffering and evil in the world. The fact that he hasn't, uh, and there's no evidence that he will uh, suggest that this is that the Christian God does not exist. And therefore, I submit my case that uh, Christianity cannot possibly be true. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel, for the opening speech. And now that we've heard uh, from Samuel and Tom on their opening speeches, let's go with the creme de la creme, which is the rebuttal of both statements. And we're back with Tom again. Tom, this is your time. You have six minutes. Over to you, Tom. Uh, thanks, Samuel. So uh, Samuel brought up four arguments. One first was the ontological argument. And I don't support the ontological argument. The ontological argument is just uh, gibberish from Anselm. I'm going to go based off of the Bible, not what Anselm wrote, because he's just a man. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So the fact that you can imagine the greatest possible being, that, that doesn't mean anything. What we can imagine as human beings is irrelevant. What matters is 
what God does, whether or not we can show there's evidence that he exists in the world, not just make up silly arguments. Second was that God can't change. Why well, I reject that completely in the Bible. It says God changes all the time. He gets angry and jealous and vengeful and he takes action and he makes Pharaoh's heart, hardens Pharaoh's heart. He literally does things. So he definitely causes change. The idea that he doesn't cause change is kind of incoherent. Um, he mentioned the Old Testament is not a continuation of the New Testament. I don't see that as necessarily a defeater for Christianity as God may have used the Old Testament in order to guide people in such a way uh, that would make a sufficient change for some unknown end that he has, and then have a change in the New Testament to guide it in a different way in order to accommodate the different cultures of the time period who may or may not adopt the principles being presented. So in order, the Old Testament was written specifically for the people during that time period, the New Testament was written for the people in the, that time period. So the change in the doctrine is only apparent insofar as it is meant to guide the civilizations in the correct direction, not give a perfect exact understanding from the moment of the Old Testament. Um, second, the, the last problem he brought up was the problem of evil and suffering. The problem of suffering is only a problem if God doesn't have sufficient reason to allow the suffering. For example, if it is, it's a greater good to create all of us with the freedom and choices to be able to live in a world of suffering, and we all choose to live in a world of suffering, then that allowing us the choice to live in a world of suffering versus forcing us to be in a perfect world of his design would be a greater good. So even if we choose to be in this world of suffering, if we voluntarily choose to be a part of it, even if there is suffering and evil in it that God created because we wanted it, then it would be moral for him to allow us to do that. And it would be immoral for him to stop us from doing that without our consent. So the problem of suffering isn't really an issue if God allowed us to choose the suffering to voluntarily be a part of it and be a part of this world. I think that addresses all of the arguments he presented. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. Now, Sam, you got the same thing. Six minutes and over to you. Well, thank you, Tom, for that. I noticed in the opening uh, statement, you spent a lot of time arguing for the existence of God. And I said that that is not the topic of tonight's discussion. The topic is, is Christianity true? Um, and it seems that the focus was on God's existence. So uh, let's deal with a few of those claims to start with. Number one, uh, you argued that you, 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 it's interesting that in the rebuttal, you actually said that you, you don't uh, you know, hold to the gibberish of the ontological argument by Anselm, and yet you said in your opening statement that uh, the necessary foundation of reality, you know, it cannot lead to an infinite regress and therefore employing some sort of a contingency or cosmological argument. So I wonder if you, you, you maintain that consistency and say, well, either I'm going with philosophy or I'm going with uh, you know, the Bible. You, it, it seems to me you can't hold both, uh, or at least you refuse to. So uh, I think there's a little bit of inconsistency in Tom's approach. So. Um, when he says that you know it cannot go back to an infinite regress and consciousness and all that, does that actually prove Christianity is true? Absolutely not. I mean, you, for all you know, I could concede that a God exists and it doesn't necessarily have to be the God of the Bible. The topic today is not whether God exists, but whether uh, Christianity is true. So since that doesn't deal with the debate itself, uh, I'm going to bypass that um, and, and basically push that aside. What about the argument from consciousness. Uh, he says that we have consciousness. Yeah, it, I mean, for all we know, we just happen to be living in a universe where consciousness is a given. Uh, we just happen to be living in a world where, uh, which allows for consciousness. And if, it, if we happen to be living in a universe that did not, or we happen, this universe that we are in simply did not allow for consciousness, how would we know? We would not have been conscious to know uh, that it was not a life permitting universe. So I don't think that argument actually holds a lot of weight. Third, uh, you brought up uh, objective morality and you said that, uh, you know, I noticed, and I appreciate the honesty, Tom, where you actually said it seems to point to objective morality. And I'll give you that. On surface, it seems to point to objective morality, but ultimately what grounds do you have? I mean, what, what's the basis? What's the evidence uh, that you would say that morality is objective apart from appealing to moral experience? It seems to me that your entire argument hinges upon our moral experience and taking that as trustworthy in the absence of any supporting evidence. Uh, that to me uh, demonstrates a, a big weakness uh, in just appealing to objective morality. And, 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 and the next question obviously is that it leads to the Eutifero dilemma. 
it's an action good because God says so, and in which case God can make up anything arbitrarily and that would be true, or it's an action good because God knows it is good. If God knows it is good, uh, then it's going to lead to also a series of problems where morality uh, can pretty much be, uh, it, it, moral, morality can pretty much be greater than God, where God himself is subservient to morality. So I think you've not demonstrated that objective morality even points to Christianity, never mind uh, lending credibility to the existence of God. What about the claim of the historicity of Jesus Christ? Uh, well, Jesus could have existed, and I don't think any historian with the right frame of mind will deny the historicity of the person of Jesus Christ. But does the existence of Jesus prove the validity of Christianity? My, argue, my argument is no. Uh, there's absolutely nothing uh, that uh, you know, demonstrates that Christianity is true. As In fact, my previous arguments I, I mentioned um, that all of the arguments that we have actually prove that Christianity is not true. The continuation of the Old and the New Testament is not seen. If Jesus is building of the Old Testament, um, we don't see evidence of why he's, he's, he's changing it. He's not consistent with the God of the Old Testament. Um, and, and I like the fact you say it's not completely irrational because that demonstrates some uncertainty even within you, uh, whether you believe it is rational or not. Um, what about the experiences that you cited? Well, experiences, many people of different faiths have experiences. I'm, I'm sure you're not going to say that they are all right because they have experiences, Tom. So it seems to me that uh, just citing experience alone is arbitrary. A lot of people have experiences. I have experiences. And I know Hindus and Jewish people and, and Muslim people all have different experiences. They can't all be true. So uh, citing the historicity of Jesus it's not going to prove the validity of Christianity. Uh, even if Jesus did some miracles, even if he did miracles, we've got lots of stories of Sai Baba, for example, doing miracles. That, would that be then count as evidence uh, for Hinduism or that branch of Hinduism? I think it's a really weak argument. So, uh, oh yeah, I did, I did want to tackle the DNA claim as well and just mention that it has nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity could very well be false. And that fact that, you know, the, the, uh, the intelligent design could have come from aliens of some sort. That's, that's I mean, Richard Daw Dawkins has proposed that. Uh, and there's no reason to think why that could not have been the case. My point is it does you not have 50 seconds left. to Christianity being true. All right. Now, I just want to tackle, well, I guess I'll tackle the, uh, some of the rebuttals that Tom has raised uh, in, uh, the, uh, in my cross-examination or the next section. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam and Tom. And before we move on, uh, if you have any questions for either Samuel or Tom uh, concerning their statements, uh, put them down in the chat box by stating your questions and to whom you're addressing it to. I repeat, if you have questions for either Samuel and Tom, just put them on the chat box, uh, state your questions and to whom you're addressing it to. Now we're going to move on. We have a cross-examination of both statements. Now, Tom, you have seven minutes. Over to you, sir. Over to you, Tom. Um, all right. So you mentioned the ontological argument. Since I don't accept that, that's not really relevant to my position or Christianity in general. In fact, it's not really relevant to any of them. Um, you said God cannot change. Why wouldn't God be able to change? What, what, where does your basis for that? I noticed you made the first statement uh, that you don't believe in the ontological argument, and which is clearly a straw man. I never cited the ontological argument in that that is true. I'm simply saying that the, it's the Christian view that God is the maximally greatest being. That's just that's just what Christians believe. Um, I don't see. I that's don't not think anywhere a, in the Bible. That doesn't say maximally anywhere in the Bible. That's some planting of gibberish. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> well, for all I mean, if Christians believe that someone else is greater than God, uh, I don't think that's consistent with the Bible as well. So I, I don't think that it's just, it's I just agree changing that, the terminology. Definitely. It's not. It doesn't actually change the fact. Uh, and the Bible says that God is greater. There's no one greater than God. I agree with that, but the cannot change is just kind of an irrelevant addition. You don't need that to be the no, greatest not possible at all. being. Absolutely not, because the Bible, I, I actually cited scripture verses where it says, I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I'm wondering how you would deal with that. Well, it's pretty simple. It's not meant in a literal way of literal no change at all, because obviously it says God got angry, God got jealous, God 
hardened Pharaoh's heart. Like that was a change. They literally did things. He acted in the world. So if you're taking the most general definition of change, God changes all the time, but his fundamental nature doesn't change. And so he doesn't need to be completely changeless throughout all possible contingencies. He can change in certain ways. Like his emotions can change. It says God has lots of emotions. Um, and he makes decisions and he acts things and he punishes Adam and Eve for eating the apple. He didn't, he didn't like do that before they were born or before he created them, like that happened after they ate the apple. So it's not a changeless thing. He can definitely change and do things in the, in the sense that he can take action, but he doesn't change. His fundamental nature doesn't change. So that, that isn't really relevant. The fact that he can't change in the philosophical sense is just not really relevant to the Bible at all. It's, he can definitely change. He has emotions. I was just wondering whether there was going to be a question at the end of that because this is a cross examination. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, why not? <laughs> so yeah, that seems that seems to be irrelevant to why. Why do you think that's relevant at all to Christianity? Well, because the Bible plainly states in those exact words that God do not change. In fact, it's not that the Bible saying God does not change; it's God speaking in the first person who says, "I do not change." Uh, and you do have clearly a change uh, in the nature where Christ becomes man and so forth. So I think that's a, you can brush that away by saying it's not literal, but if any person reading that back in the day before the rise of Christianity would, re would have taken that literally to mean the immutability of God, that God cannot change. Because you see, part of the problem is this, if you have God is the greatest being, was God greater before the change of becoming man or was God, uh, you know, uh, inferior after becoming man, you end up with a God that was either greater before or after the incarnation. And that just contradicts the very nature of God's being unchanging. I think you're equivocating between the use of change as it was used in the culture back then and the way, you, way it's used in philosophy now. And the way it's used philosophy now, it's like a literal no change of any kind. Like you can't speak because that requires a physical change of some kind. You can't act because that requires a, a change in time and space. Whereas that's not what it meant back in the Hebrew time when the word was originally used, it, had, it didn't have any of those connotations. It meant his fundamental nature, his essence didn't change, but he could still act. And so that it seems like, or, or do you think that you're equivocating the use of change as it was then and the use of the change as it was now? Or do you have any reason to believe that the philosophical usage now would apply back then? Um, no, I, I don't think we are talking about a philosophical use at all. I just think that the word change, ironically, doesn't change. Uh, it just meant the same thing back then as it does now. Change is a very plain meaning. And when you deal with the Hebrew uh, culture, unless you have some exegetical biblical evidence within the context that would show it's not meant to be taken literally, I guess that could be applied to everything, including the life of Jesus doesn't have to be taken literally. It was some terrible for us to draw some spiritual meaning out of it. So I think that there's no way you can consistently say, well, I believe in some parts uh, which are historical, but when the Bible plainly says that God does not change, that we ought to take that to mean something non-literal. I think the word change is fairly plain, I think, for anyone, both in the Hebrew culture back then or anyone reading it today. The Hebrew culture used the term change many, many times throughout many different documents throughout the period. And it never implied that the usage would mean there's absolutely no, like in, in the way you're using it, it seems like change could only apply to a singular entity, kind of like the ontological argument of this perfect essence thing. And anything else is going to change in some way based on the definition of change you're using. But the word change was used many times throughout Hebrew culture to apply to many things that are not this ultimate essence thing. And so in the things that don't change, it just means some fundamental part of its nature doesn't change. It doesn't mean there's literally no change at all in the ontological sense, the way the philosophical words use it. So there's clearly a difference in usage, don't you think, between the way it was used then and the way it's used now? Like, it seems like the way it's used now is a much more modern incarnation that came about in like the 1600s, uh, that there is absolutely no kinds of change, no physical change, no emotional change, no any change. Like, that doesn't seem to be in any way related to the Old Testament usage of change. No, I, again, I, I would have to disagree on that and just simply say the word change means change. And the fact that I feel that you're, I feel you're clutching at straws in, in trying to rescue the biblical interpretation in the face of very clear defeaters uh, to that, because I think the doctrine of God's immutability is something that Christians from all ages um, have held. Uh, it, it, the doctrine of divine immutability. And if you want to reject that saying, well, you know, I don't want to hold on to philosophy. I'm taking word for word what the Bible says. Well, guess what? You've got a problem as well because the Bible says that. You said about the change in nature. Well, the, when Christ became man, that was a change in nature. So it is change. It, we're not talking about some sort of a change in reaction or a change in attitude or a change in emotions. We're talking about change in nature here. 
becoming man. That's a fundamental change. And I think that uh, the only way, you, and I can totally understand you not wanting to take that literally or to kind of um, play around with the word of change. But I think that anyone reading that back and now it's pretty plain to them. Yeah, I think we just have a different understanding of what the word change means in context. I get 30 you know, seconds left. So yeah, uh, I guess we, I guess I don't have time to go into the other ones. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll let Samuel go. All right, great. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. Now, uh, Samuel, the same thing. Uh, you have about seven minutes and over to you, Samuel. All right, uh, let's tackle, let's go and revisit uh, the four arguments I used. The first one I said is that God uh, does not change. Do you believe that there's any being greater than God? No. Okay, then in that sense, you believe that God is the maximally greatest being in that there's no greater being than God. If you just want to use those terms synonymously, then yes. Right, so you, if... Do you believe that God was greater? I mean, at least God the Son was greater prior to the incarnation when he became man? Or do you believe he was uh, greater before he became man or after he became man? Which one is Same. it? Because there was he a was equally age. great in both. Um, and how would you justify uh, the fact that there was a change, at least in death and the resurrection, when the Bible in the Old Testament says in Malachi 3.6 that I, the Lord, do not change? How because would you interpret that in context? Because change only applies to his nature. It doesn't mean he literally does nothing. Uh, where does the context say that? Just the word change and the way it's used in Hebrew culture and every culture in everywhere, everywhere in the human history, other than a very particular branch of philosophy, the word change is referring to an essence, not literally no kinds of change at all. So like if I, if I pick my nose, I'm still me. I have not changed. The, if, if we go to the Hebrews, we went back in time and I said a word, would, and I ask them, have I changed? They're going to say, no, you haven't changed. You're still you. you. The essence of you is still the same. The same thing would apply to them if they say, have right. you changed when you scratch your butt or whatever? They're like, no, I'm still me. The change has not occurred. So certain kinds of interactions, like interactions in time and space, which would apply, which would be a kind of change in the, philo the strict philosophical sense, would not be a kind of change in the old Hebrew sense. Well, I, I would say that uh, there's a fundamental difference between scratching your nose uh, and becoming a robot, for example. That, that involves fundamental change, especially if you choose to be as man. If that was possible, become a robot, would you disagree? Oh, no, I, there's definitely like that would becoming a robot would be a diff, definitely a kind of change, not like picking your nose. But in the case and yet, of. And yet, God becoming man is not a change for you. Uh, no, because he's still God. He has a soul. Oh. Like the fact that he gave himself a physical body doesn't in any way change his essence. It's okay, like him so picking his nose. Just, just to rephrase that, man becoming robot, fundamental change, but God becoming man, no change. Uh, yeah, because the essence okay. of God is the soul, not the body. All right, we're, we're going to have to move on. Okay, let's uh, let's deal with the next one, which I brought up, which is objective morality. Um, you, you did mention that as well. Uh, what what evidence is there that morality is objective? Uh, the same evidence we have that we can see things at very, very, very far distances. The fact that everyone has the similar experience. It's possible that we're all having a collective delusion, but it seems more likely that we are actually onto something that this experience we're having is indicative of something true of the world. We just can't verify it yet. On what basis is it more likely uh, that we are not delusional uh, that, and that, that, you know, we are actually, that morality is actually objective? I mean, you, you said that. What's, what's the basis of saying that? The fact that there's so much similarity across cultures in what we see as being moral and immoral, that fact that we see the same thing pretty regularly across cultures throughout time is indicative that there's some fundamental core there. Like uh, if everyone sees the same thing in a picture, when they look at the picture, it's reasonable to think that the picture is actually there. It's not just a delusion because if it was a delusion, it doesn't make much sense that the same delusion would be shared across cultures and time periods. Uh, what about people that don't feel moral empathy? Um, are they, what if they, you know, in terms of objective moral values, they, they, they don't share that. They don't feel the same way. Psychopaths, for example, how would that uh, resonate with your view of objective morality? Well, because it's such a small minority of people, it's kind of like the blind or colorblind. It's a specific kind of a condition where they see things differently, but it doesn't change the fact that the vast majority of people do see this. And because it's such a consistent phenomenon, that's the reason it's reasonable to believe it's an actual thing, not just a delusion. If it was I, I, like 50-50, then maybe it would be reasonable, but it's such like 90, 80, 90 something percent. So 
50-50 would be a problem for you to demonstrate that objective morality does not work. But if it is 90-10, uh, it's objective morality, where would you draw the line? Uh, P-values. I just, I just use the P-value okay. metric of science. All right, I'll leave it there and we'll go to the next point, which is the fundamental change between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, would you agree that, for example, that the old te- God in the Old Testament murdered people? Yes. Would you agree that Jesus being God in the New Testament did not? Uh, I'm going to go with the Trinitarian where Jesus is God, so he did murder people too. No, I'm talking he, about he in the New Testament. Did okay, Jesus yeah. command the killing of pe- people? No, no, he did not. No. So you, you would see there's a fundamental difference between the two. Why, why is the difference? Uh, acting differently at different time periods doesn't mean there's a fundamental difference. It means there's different criterion. Like when, I'm, when, I like when I wake up in the morning, I drink coffee. But when I go to bed, I don't drink coffee because there's a different consequence to the actions. So the fact that the actions are different in different time periods means there could be a reason why those differences occur. It doesn't mean there's a difference in the, the nature of the being itself. And that's, that's certainly possible. I'll grant you that. But why though? Why, why the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? You, in your uh, rebuttal, you actually said because to guide them in a particular way, the right way. Uh, do you think that killing people is, is guiding them the right way? Um, I think that it can be justified to kill people, for example, in the cases of self-defense. And so if... Oh, but clearly the Old Testament is not talking about self-defense. They were the uh, aggressors there against the Canaanites and the Amalekites. Uh, yeah, it's like premeditated. What's it? I forget what it's called. The pre pre strike something in military term. Uh, Preemptive can strike. Be, yeah, yeah. So kind of like killing baby Hitler. Like if you know what they're going to do is going to have a sufficiently negative consequence, you can preemptively attack them. And in that case, it could be justified in order to kill them beforehand. Right. So, but my my let, let's go with the New Testament. So why then do you believe these things did not? carry on to the New Testament. Why was there a need to change? Granted, they were li- living in the Roman Empire, which were far worse than, say, the Canaanites uh, and the Amalekites. Why you the have difference 30 all of a sudden? I think because of moral progress, uh, the fact that, for example, uh, a thousand years ago, we needed to eat lots of meat to survive, and we couldn't survive without it. But today, we can survive without meat, and so as a culture, we're moving away from eating meat. The same thing could be true of the time period of Jesus in the Old Testament, where the Old Testament it was much more brutal because of the restrictions on the environment. We didn't have the same technological level. And in the New Testament, we had evolved so- society enough to be able to move on to the next stage of human progress. See my time is up, but thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Tom, for, uh, for those statements. And now we're just moving on to uh, discussions and Q&A sessions. And uh, let me begin with uh, asking you both, how, uh, where, where do you, how does it feel like playing a role? Uh, Wait, are we, are role? we there yet? I thought there's a conclusion. Wait, let me just check. Um, there's supposed to be a discussion, 15 minutes, uh, yeah, which discussion. you can skip if you want. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, no, we can't skip the open discussion. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go to the discussion period, 15 yeah. minutes of open discussion. Yeah, let's do that. So, All right, right. so to, to jump right in. Um, that, I used... That's your surname, I'll let you do that, okay. <laughs> yes. So uh, I used general arguments for the existence of God, like the necessary being argument and the objective morality and the DNA code argument as a basis to ground why we believe there is a God at all. And then I used a more specific argument to indicate the Christian God, which is testable predictions. The revelations make testable predictions about what's going to happen in the future. We have testable predictions about what's going to happen when you open your heart up to God. We have testable predictions about what's going to happen after you die. The testable predictions is what indicates Christianity is true as opposed to the other religions. If Christianity can make testable predictions that you that other religions can't. That is good evidence of Christianity. For example, um, the experiences you mentioned. Yes, lots of people have different experiences. But if I have the experience that I pray to God for something to happen and it happens, and I pray to God again for something to happen and it happens, and there are these significant events that occur in my life when I pray, and I have a reasonable inductive inference that every time I do pray that it will occur at a higher than random chance then i have a good reason to believe in christianity even if no one else experiences that so the personal experiences that you have when you do pray to god when you do open yourself up does give us good reason to believe in christianity um, even if other people don't have the experiences or even if other people have experiences of other things the evidence of it being able to make testable predictions in our lives is sufficient reason to justify belief in a god in addition to those other arguments that give evidence of a general kind of a god 
No, I, I, like I said earlier, I'm willing to grant that, for example, that for the sake of argument, let's just say a God exists. But the topic of today's debate is just a Christian. I mean, is Christianity true? And the basis of religious experience will not justify Christianity being true. All, Wait, at you best, mean? all you can sure do. Can. No, obviously you can't because, for example, you have Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, all having contradicting experiences. Uh, so even well, if I didn't run, there was a God, which I'm not, uh, it wouldn't lead to the Christianity being true at all. So why, why well, think why, that why Christianity would, there, would be true? Why would their experience in any way detract from mine? So if I have experiences of God in my life and I can pray to God and have him interact in my life and I can talk to him and he does things when I pray to him, and that happens at a more than a higher rate than chance. That gives me justifiable reason to believe God is real, even if it doesn't give you justifiable reason. Or if even if there's a Buddhist who prays to Buddha and he has a higher than chance rate that Buddha exists, he is justified in believing Buddha exists. But that doesn't in any way detract from my justification in believing Jesus exists because I still have those testable predictions in my life. No, I mean, I, I'm willing to grant for the sake of argument that you're praying. And let's just say for the sake, I mean, I take, I take everything that you say to be true, that, that somehow your prayers are all being answered miraculously. That still doesn't prove that Christianity is true. All that proves is there's an entity out there that is granting you your desires at best, at best. Now, number two, what you have is that other people, what about the rest of the people who are praying and are getting their answers to their prayer at a far larger, a far bigger uh, rate than what you are getting? Then so they would, would you then justified... say that that falsifies your position? No, that would mean that they were justified in believing their positions, but that wouldn't affect my position. So again, agreed, not, agreed. But sure. it still doesn't prove that Christianity is true. It just proves that there's a God and there's a being out there that grants answers to prayer. That's well, my it point. seems like you're rejecting the entire basis of science here, because the entire basis of science is, is testable predictions. If you can make testable predictions and get a result at a higher than chance rate, then you are justified in making believing that your hypothesis is true. So if I have testable predictions that Jesus exists and God is real by praying and getting results at a higher than chance rate, that does justify my belief that Christianity is true, just like it does any scientific belief. It doesn't no, prove think... it with absolute certainty, but it does conclude it's true, just like in any scientific theory. I think when you talk about justification, there are a few things we need to bear in mind. First of all, there's the Gettier problem in justification, whether justification, the, the, the standard, uh, you know, uh, justify true belief JTB formulation is alone enough, or whether in light of the Gettier problem, you need to add something else or either modify our understanding of justification. But that's a separate issue altogether. All I'm saying is you may be justifiable in believing that only in the absence of any rational defeaters. If I'm presenting rational defeaters to that, namely that other people are doing that with their gods and that's contradicting yours. So you cannot be justified in the, I mean, you cannot be justified if you are aware of these rational defeaters, which I'm now presenting to you. So you no, you can't be. That, that's not a rational defeater at all. Like one, my God could be granting their miracles. That's a possibility. Maybe they're making it up, whatever. I don't know. I don't have their Wouldn't the same set. be true of yours? From their perspective, it could be, but it can't be true from my perspective because I'm only, so, I have a specific data set. I have the only data set I am aware of is mine. I can't live their experiences. I know that in my life, the testable predictions of the prayer work at a higher than chance rate. Now, maybe it does in their life too. I don't know that. I can't verify that. I can't test their, their predictions. And if it does, then there's, that's not a defeater. It just means that there are other possible abilities to explain that, but it's totally reasonable for two scientists to come up with alternative hypotheses and they both make testable predictions and if they are both confirmed, uh, then the scientists are each reasonable in believing their own hypothesis and rejecting the other because they have justified reason to believe their hypothesis is true in those testable predictions. It, it doesn't, yeah. the fact that there's another one that makes testable predictions doesn't invalidate the first. The, the first is still supported by the evidence of the testable predictions, even if there are others. Except that I'm saying that it, except that all I'm saying is two problems here. The first problem is that you have other people that are doing the exact same thing, meaning that they are justifiable, which will basically go back to the topic of today's debate. The topic of today's debate is not whether you can be justified in believing the Christian God exists by on the basis of certain testable predictions. The title is, is Christianity true? And, and I think we should stick to that topic and saying that doesn't amount to evidence if another person out there is able to do miracles and have his prayers answered too, you need to show why Christianity is true or truer than say the other person's religion. And you haven't done that. So again, and, and by the way, you still are, you, you haven't responded to all the points that I've mentioned, including uh, the fundamental change between God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the fundamental, the problem of evil and suffering, which we haven't touched in the cross-examination. Uh, how is it that God who is good, able to decree evil? And, and in, in your Christian worldview, how is that even able to happen? 
uh, like if God is perfectly good and you ask him to create evil, then he'd be moral to create evil for you. So that would not be immoral for him to do so. So which creation, according to the Christian worldview, asked God to create evil? Uh, Adam and Eve when they ate the apple. They, they never asked him to create evil. As far as I understand it, that's since the story is not literal, it's not literally true, but the story can be interpreted as they wanted the knowledge of good and evil. And in order to have the knowledge of good and evil, it has to be an evil. Yeah, I mean, so let, let's let's take that for the sake of argument. So God is in control. You believe that God, I mean, do you, I, I, is, is it fair yes. to say you believe that God is, is in control in a deterministic sense? Or do you believe that God is in control and he gives libertarian free will? Mm. What, what's your libertarian view exactly? Because libertarian free will, right? So you believe that God, before he created the world, he could have kept the tree in a particular location. Sure. That would have seen, for example, that they would not have taken the knowledge of good and evil and eaten that. God could have done that. Sure. Yet God chose to have them do that. Yep. So he decrees evil. Not uh, on the basis decrees... of what not on the basis of what Adam and Eve wanted, on the basis of what he wanted. He gave them the option, they chose to they chose to eat the apple. No, he didn't merely give them the option. He made the situation viable that there was no way they could have chosen otherwise. Well, no, I think he actually pre-gave them free will. So they actually made the choice to do it. And then they chose to uh, acknowledge suffering and pain and, and learn about those things. You, you just said that if, the, for example, if God had kept the tree and say position X, they would not have chosen to eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Right. So, so I think it's moral for him, for God to give them the option and then they choose to do it. That's fine. If God I, just... I, we're not talking about the option, Tom. We're not talking about the option. We're saying that God, if God keeps the tree in position Y, the fall happens. Adam and Eve choose to do it. They're tempted by it and that happens. If God keeps the tree in position X, the fall does not happen. So God, you would, you would agree that God has the freedom in determining whether the tree of knowledge and evil is in spot X or spot Y, right? Sure. So why does he put it in a place knowing full well that this is going to happen? Because it's it's moral to give us the option. Like if I if someone wants candy and I know that they're going to get fat if they eat candy, it's still moral for me to give them the candy. Like I, wouldn't I, it's, it? It's not it's not more moral for me to not give them the candy if they want the no, candy. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't they still have the libertarian free will if they had kept the, the tree in say position Y instead of X or X instead of Y, where they would not have happened? The free will is still there. Sure, sure. I I, I think that God gave them free will before he ate the apple. I think the ap apple is about suffering and evil, not about free will. So. They have free will, and then they can use that free will to eat the apple and learn about the suffering and pain and, and the right between good and evil. And that's what happened. Is that, so he gave them the option, even knowing they would choose the evil, he gave them the option and they did choose the evil. So, so it's still you, their choice. No, I, mean, I don't know. I've never denied it. it's their choice. All I'm saying is if you are a parent and you put a knife in the, child, in the hand of your child and say, well, you get to use the knife for good or evil and then your child cuts the hand, wouldn't you be charged with negligence knowing full well that what the child would do with a knife? If they were a child, yeah, but I think that if they're a fully a grown adult with the right to make a decision for themselves, then we should give them the right to decide that. We can't just take all knives away from all adults. If you're an adult, but wait, you, you, right you, just, you just said that Adam and Eve did not have knowledge of good and evil prior to eating of that tree. Right, so but I, I think they did they have been mature will. enough to know the consequences of it? Like a child right. would not know the consequences of it as well. I think it's analogous. I think as long as they have free will, then they are sufficient to be considered adults in that case. I think God had the option to create them as adults and give them the freedom to be able to choose as adults. And he gave freedom them or right. free will? Same thing. What, what, define, how would you define free will? Uh, the ability to do otherwise. And, and Okay, so your, your freedom and free will is the same thing then. Okay, for, let's move on to the question about, uh, you know, that I book, the, the fundamental changes between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, why exactly is the change? It seems to me in the cross-examination, you didn't really tackle that point at all. You kind of sidestepped it, saying there could be reasons. What's the reason, ultimately, that God wants this to change? Well, I, I did. I, I specifically said that the reason you would have differences is based on the different technological levels at the time. If, uh, for example, I gave the example of eating meat. In the past, we had to eat meat to survive. If we didn't, we would all die. Now we don't need to eat meat anymore because we have the technological ability to live without that. In the same thing could be said of the Old Testament, the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the way our cultures and technology developed, we had a different set of conditions we needed to live by in order to function. And in the New Testament, we had developed to a sufficient amount of point that we could live by a different set of conditions and so we could learn and grow at a different rate. And that's what, why there was a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So because you, so you, our, you, 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 Sorry, sorry. You, you, I'll, I'll let you finish that point. Oh, that's fine. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to say, so you fundamentally believe that in the Old Testament, you just use your 
necessary to eat meat analogy, you fundamentally believe that in the Old Testament, they had to kill people? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think that especially like in hunter-gatherer societies, if you didn't, then lots of people, you'd just be wiped out, which is what happened in hunter-gatherer societies. And that's essentially what would happen if you didn't kill people at the same time period, you'd get wiped out. Because if- There's absolutely no evidence for that. What do you mean? Like there's the entire no evidence, history for example, there's history? no evidence that, for example, that if Israel had not killed the Amalekites, that the Amalekites would have wiped them out. What evidence is there for that? It's purely speculative, it seems. It, it almost seems like it, it's after the fact justification rather than, uh, and in, can actually look at that and justify that in and of itself. Well, I just look at human history and that's literally what happens everywhere. If you don't get, if you don't conquer, you get conquered. That's literally the human history of everywhere. Yeah, I mean, so so the, the, the point is that the, why wouldn't that be applicable in the New Testament? Because it seems that the circumstances had not changed. You still had a Roman Empire that would have wiped out the entire Jewish race. Uh, the, the threat is still there. Why not practice the same thing? It just seems that uh, your, your justification is after the fact. It, the situation is virtually the same. Well, actually, it seems like as history moves forward, things get more peaceful and there's less war and less death and less killing by uh, conflict. So actually... The, there does seem to be a significant difference between those time periods and the time period of the empire. Namely, there's enough agriculture to support lots of people. There was a much more peaceful environment of, even though there were wars at the time, it was not as bad as it was in the hunter-gatherer societies where everyone was just killing everyone when you just met. So as history continues forward, we actually see there's a consistent pattern of less violence and less death by war over a longer period of time as technology grows. And so it's reasonable to conclude that the greater levels of violence exist in the Old Testament because of their lower levels of technology. And as it grew in the New Testament, there was a much higher level of peace than previously because of the like agriculture and the different warring factions had created a uh, much more stable, uh, I forget what it's called, that when everyone has nukes and you can't do anything, balance of power or something, the, the same kind of a principle would apply. Right. But what about the theological reasons? What about the fact that, for example, you have sacrifices in the Old Testament, you have, for example, the keeping of the Sabbath, which Christians in the New Testament were not doing. Uh, how do you explain those differences? God the, same with the, of those laws? Uh, the same thing. It's, uh, it has to do with the time period and what you could do. Like, for example, don't eat shellfish. Don't eat shellfish applies to the Old Testament because you get killed because of the bacteria and you didn't have anybody cleaning the bacteria out. Whereas now we can just clean the bacteria out, no problem. And so we, the same law wouldn't apply now because it's not really a concern of the time period. So certain laws would apply to those uh, time periods, specifically to those time periods because of the limitations they had technologically. Right. I'll, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm done, Christian. If you want to ask me a question, yeah, feel, feel free to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what created the universe if God doesn't exist? Well, I think that uh, when you ask the question, that is a convoluted question, because when you ask the question, what created the, the universe, you're assuming that the universe needs a creator without even establishing that, that there is a need for one. Uh, for all I know, the universe could have existed for all eternity. Well, the Big Bang, time, space, and matter and energy came to existence at the Big Bang, so the universe must have had a beginning. Uh, no, that's actually not the case. There are actually multiple theories that have already been offered to explain that away. Uh, one of them could be, you know, for example, the big crunch, the inflation contraction theory. Uh, you also have a variety of different theories that have been postulated, uh, one of them being the multiverse. Uh, that would just basically say that our universe is just one of the baby universes in a whole whirlpool of universes. So I don't think that that uh, that necessarily needs a cause. I think it's, it's almost begging the question to think the universe needs a cause. Uh, and therefore, let's find and make God the cause of it. Oh, yeah, sure. Thinking, yeah. I think as Sigmund Freud uh, pointed out. Well, yeah, sure. But the point is that it, presuming that the Big Bang Theory is correct, it has a cause and there are multiple different explanations of what that cause could be. But if I already have an existing basis of evidence to conclude there is a God, like my personal experience and test predictions, then I can also infer that that gives me good reason to believe that God created the universe because it's consistent with the data. So if, if like we see a hoof print in the snow, we can say, well, what caused the hoof print? Um, either it's a horse or a unicorn. If it's, we could say it's a horse and that's reasonable because we have past evidence of horses. We have lots of past evidence, but would it be unreasonable to say it's a unicorn because we have no past evidence of unicorns. In the case of the multiverse or the big crunch, we have no evidence of those things, but we, but I, 
we do have evidence of a God. We have lots of evidence of testable predictions we can do to demonstrate that there is reasonable to conclude there is a God through the miracles and things and the personal experience and the testable predictions and revelation. We have lots of ways to conclude that. So it's reasonable to infer Big Bang was caused by God because we have all of his background knowledge. Wouldn't you agree? I'd like the horse unicorn analogy. No, 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 I don't think they're analogous at all. Uh, I think, for example, that a string of bad arguments don't make a good one. Um, and I think that, um, that that's something that's pretty obvious. So uh, let's just say that, first of all, we assume that the universe needs a cause. And then we put on a series of things and say why the universe needs to have a cause. And therefore, God is the explanation to it. Number two, you don't have any evidences at all that would suggest that God exists. All you do have out a string of inferences to which even the best apologists like William Lane Craig would say uh, that God is the best explanation. Inferences to the best explanation. You don't have any evidence for God. So why well, would you think that God would be a better explanation? Inferences, inferences are evidence. Like everything in science is an inference. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So at, at best, I mean, no, no. I, I wouldn't say everything in science. Is gra gravity based on an inference? Uh, you can yeah, test gravity. Of... You can... The, 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 round, the globe earth, you've... You, yeah, I mean, when you, for example, the fact that we're not living in a flat earth, that's not based on an inference. In, in, in an inference, in inference is a conclusion based on reason and evidence. Yeah, and, and evidence, what I understand as evidence is observation. You ask, why couldn't we have gone, why, why don't we see, you know, for example, the Big Bang being caused by itself? Um, well, no one was there to observe it. So right. No one so, so observe that being a god as well. You're just basically inferring on the series of things that I don't think are very strong evidences at all. You just one day. How, how are testable predictions not very strong evidence? Like that's literally the basis of all science. What what test, testable predictions are you referring to? I can test and make predictions in my life, and I can pray to God, and I expect that a higher rate of chance it'll have an effect in my life. Like that's testable prediction. I mean, you can make testable predictions about anything that you want. Uh, until yeah, but I get, they get confirmed at a higher rate than chance. That's literally the definition so of evidence what, in science. what testable evidence would you put that would confirm that God exists? You can pray to him. And if, he, if you open your heart, he'll reveal himself to you. And you can pray for his influence in your life. And he'll help you out in more cases every, if you do it. For every one person that makes a claim that they prayed and they got an answer, I can show you there are at least five people that prayed and did not give an answer. So I think the evidence is stacked against you in that, in that particular case. Even if that was true, that doesn't detract from the evidence of it being effective in my life. So the, no, I the think fact it just disproves the case. It's testable. It's not testable because it, it actually clearly it's evidences to the contrary that are stronger. Well, that's, this, that's definitely testable. The fact that it failed for some people doesn't make it not testable. So if for me, I demonstrate it fails for most correct, people, so just to put it in context, fails for most people. Not that it well, fails for most for people, people. Most people are religious. Most people say they do have experiences like that. I don't know why you would say that. So, it, but the point is, is that if in time. your life, if in your life you can demonstrate these testable predictions and you get the results, that is good evidence for you, regardless of anybody else. So like, for example, if I do an experiment in science and I see that there's a, a, a galaxy or something in one particular pop, spot, but no one else sees it, but I can continually see it over and over and over again, I still have reason to believe it's there, even if everyone else can't see it, even if no one else can see it. And the fact that I see it and lots of other also people also see it, that's, again, good evidence to conclude that it's there. Same thing applies to prayer. Even though lots of people can't see it, there are many conditions where you can see it. So the test of predictions do apply as a successful reason to believe in many cases, even if they don't necessarily show up in all cases. Let me be 100% no, accurate. I, I, I think that actually in far more cases that, the, in, that it demonstrates that actually prayer doesn't work. For example, uh, for example, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, take any, what, what's your favorite line of the Lord's Prayer? Uh, the first one. <laughs> Okay, let, let's just start with, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, thy kingdom come, okay, which is a line in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, let, let's just take that and say, okay, people, Christians have been praying throughout the ages, reciting the prayer so many times, every Sunday in church. Uh, that never came true. The kingdom of God has not come on earth yet. So that would be, for example, an evidence where the vast majority of people, in fact, I shouldn't say vast majority, every single Christian that has been making that prayer has had, not had that prayer answered. That's an example of, so if you say that, well, people, there are many people in the world are religious. They may have one prayer answered sometime in their life. The vast majority of prayers go unanswered. That's actually evidence against the existence of God, not for him. And that's no, what no, I meant that the inference is. No, absolutely, why not? Well, it's like, I, I can, like, for I can I can predict that the multiverse will create a gold brick in front of me every five seconds, but it doesn't do that. Like, even though that's possible, given the mathematics of the multiverse, 
The fact that it doesn't do that doesn't mean it's not evidence of the multiverse. You would you would have to look for the highly probable cases that it's actually going to occur, not just the the outskirts. Like assuming that every prayer is going to get answered or that one particular prayer is going to get answered isn't evidence against the hypothesis. You have to look at the ones that will likely get answered. So the the testable predictions Why? Why how evidence it? works. Like, no, but it seems that you're, you're, you're rigging it, you know, to what you think is it, it's more easier, you know, what, what, what's relatively easier to accomplish. Why not make it about something that is a little bit more difficult? Like, for example, the one you just cited, thy kingdom come. That, that's a prayer that is a Christian is told to pray. Every Christian prays that. Um, that's not happened. Every Christian throughout the last 2000 years have been praying that. Yeah, but that's again, that's not evidence that there is no God. That's like saying it's just it's evidence that prayers don't get answered. And and it's not as if to I mean, I think your, your characterization of you know, well, prayers do get answered, that's you know, testable evidence. That actually is far more prayers don't get answered. It's like me saying that, well, I have this magical uh, ability that I'm gonna throw the dice and six is gonna come, and I end up throwing it 60 times and only get one time, you know, it appears on six. That's not evidence that I have magical powers at all, wouldn't you agree? Right, but that's my claim is that you can throw the dice and get sixes more often than chance. That's that's the claim. Other people may not be able to. I don't know about other people. I can. I, I get that experience, and it's true for many people. And so, like just like the scientific example I gave, if we can all see this galaxy that no one else can see in the sky, that's reason to believe the galaxy is there, even if no one else can see it. So even if I'm the only human being who can see this galaxy, I'm reasonable to believe it exists. It's true that that galaxy exists, even if no one else sees it. So if testable predictions can be shown to be verified for one person, that one person is reasonable to believe in the hypothesis that those testable predictions indicate. It doesn't need to be every possible prediction you could make. I can, I can pray to God for a gold brick. Does that mean a gold brick is going to come? No. Does that mean prayer doesn't get answered? Well, no, that's just a particular kind of prayer that doesn't get answered. Does that mean no prayers get answered? No. Does it mean that there isn't testable predictions for anyone else in the world? No, that just means this one kind of prayer doesn't get answered. Yeah, but again, uh, I just feel that you, you, you've kind of shifted the goal towards arguing that a person is rational in believing that prayers do get answered versus the topic of debate, which is, is Christianity true? Uh, if Christianity were to be true, uh, the prayers would all get answered. I, I think it's, I think what? you would agree. It's not, it's not. What? The if prayers Christianity would all get true, answered. I, I don't why, think why that's not? how it works. Why not? Uh, why not? Why would it? Why would all the prayers be well, answered? Let's, let's put this sense. in perspective. God tells you, pray this. You pray what God told you to pray. And what God asked you to pray did not come to pass. Why wouldn't that be evidence that you were hallucinating or something? You know, it seems the obvious conclusion, Tom. For, for that to be evidence, you would have to expect God to actually answer every prayer in the first place. If that was what we'd expect you, to see, given the hypothesis, then it would be evidence against the hypothesis if it didn't happen. But why would we expect to see that? What? You were told by God, according to you, to pray about that specific thing. And in obedience, you pray. It doesn't get answered. Why would you expect God to answer any other prayer? It never said God will answer the prayer at X date and next time if enough okay. prayers happen. Like that's that's, so not, in the, that's just, not in the Bible. So let's just say then that this confirms my view, which is what I was saying earlier, that far more prayers do not get answered. I think you've just confirmed what I just said. Prayers no, no, don't no, get answered. Because the prayer has to be relevant to the hypothesis. The, hy the hypothesis has to make the prediction that the, the prayer is going to be answered. If it doesn't make that prediction, then it isn't contrary to the hypothesis for it not to get answered. So Let it wouldn't be like... Praying to praying to this mug and saying, "Oh, this mug doesn't make the prayer that it's going to turn to a gold brick." It's like, "Oh God, what, what am I going to do? It's, it's not a mug anymore." But if I pray to the mug to hold water, it does that every single time. So if you make the prayer on the right conditions for the right expected result, that would be the evidence, not just any prayer possible. You have to no. you have to make the the prediction coherent within the the hypothesis, not just for any possible prediction. I actually think the analogy works against you because the only reason why the mug, the mug would not be able to produce gold bricks is because the mug is incapable of doing so, right? Because, and the only reason the mug is able to hold water is because that's what the mug is capable of doing so. But if you're dealing with God who has infinite cap capabilities, why wouldn't he be able to produce gold bricks? You, you, you need a theological He's capable, it's just he, he won't do it. It's like because he has a conscious thing. It's against his nature. Even though he told you to do it? Even though he told you to ask him for it? The fact that he told us to ask him for it doesn't mean he was going to give it to us. That part was not in the so, prayer. So why why then would he ask you to ask for something that he's not going to give you? It just seems like playing a bad trick on you, Tom. God works in mysterious ways, but that's irrelevant to my argument. <laughs>
So, so, so we, as long as I get testable predictions, my argument holds regardless of whether or not the other ones don't work. So just to be clear, what do you mean by testable predictions is if I rig the conditions of my prayer right, for example, I'm going for an interview, the 99% chance I'm going to get a job. I'm going to go and pray that I get the job. 99% chance I do end up getting the job. Hey, God exists because he answered my prayer. But if I ask God for something that, for example, is unlikely to happen, then forget about it because it's not going to happen because God has mysterious reasons for not answering your prayer. That's very convenient, isn't it? Oh, right. I wouldn't say that at all. I'd say that you should pray to God for things that are significant, unlikely to happen and not just pray, rig the game. That wouldn't work. So I'd say that you should make predictions about things that are unlikely to happen more. Those would be good, good testable predictions. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I think that's very hilarious. I, I mean, I rest my case on that one. Okay. So I don't know how long we have left, but Tom, if you want to ask any questions, that's fine. Oh, yeah. You have two minutes left. Yeah, I just, I think we, can go yeah. to the, we can go to the, the next section closing statements okay <laughs> go for it you both have five minutes uh let's begin with tom once again okay so my closing statement is is that there are certain reasons to believe that there is a god in general like we there's a probably a necessary grounds to the universe the dna code is a code and all codes are made by intelligence so it's reasonable to infer it's created by an intelligence the historical evidence jesus shows jesus existed the objective morality seems to indicate there is some kind of a being as a grounds object of objective morality and our test and the greatest evidence we have for christianity is testable predictions you can pray to god ask him to reveal himself to you and he can reveal himself to you the and revelations it makes predictions about what's going to happen in the end times there are testable predictions that are made by christianity that could indicate it's true and the other theories are not true just like any scientific theory testable predictions is the best kind of evidence so the reason we should believe christianity is true which is the same reason why it's reasonable to believe in christianity is the fact that it makes testable predictions uh, and i'd like to yield my time to samuel Great. Thanks, Tom. Over to you, Samuel. You have five minutes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've seen that uh, in the discussion period, uh, we, we, we saw a, uh, towards the end of the discussion period, I thank Tom for this wonderful discussion that we've had, but uh, towards the discussion period in the end, I hope that you noticed there was a complete capitulation on one side uh, where he basically flat out said that, you know, he, he, brought, he, not, he talked about testable predictions, but you've got to rig it in such a way uh, that makes God possible to answer your prayers. And only then uh, he answers your prayers. Um, friends, God can do anything he wants. Uh, and in fact, what we find in Christianity is that we are told to ask for something. And Jesus, in fact, says in Christianity that if you ask in anything in my name, I will do it for you. Why is it that some of the most basic things in Christianity that we ask, uh, we're not receiving? So, well, um, Let's go back and summarize some of the key points that I laid out at the start. I said that there were good reasons to believe that Christianity was false, and I cited four reasons. Reason number one, fundamental change in God's nature. Apart from arguing about the technicalities of the word change, Tom really provided no evidence um, that uh, the word that God did not change uh, or that uh, the word change meant change in Malachi chapter three. Number two, uh, I mentioned that um, that the, in the uh, well, let me look at my notes again. Well, yeah, I mentioned number two that there's uh, morality uh, as being. Sorry, I'm, I'm got the wrong the wrong one here. Okay, I mentioned number two that uh, problem of suffering. Um, uh, we didn't really get to discuss that in the world, uh, but according to Tom, since God gave us free will, Adam and Eve can choose uh, chose to bring suffering upon themselves by eating of the tree of knowledge in good and evil. But I demonstrated that God could determine where to keep the tree. Uh, that would have given them free will and still would not have resulted in the end conclusion. I also presented a case for the negligent parent, uh, where a, child, a, a, a parent gives the child a knife and the child hurts himself. Um, and then the child basically uh, complains and, and, and the parent says, well, you know, I gave you the knife, you had the free will to do what you want to do. Um, I showed why that, that, that doesn't make sense. It, it demonstrates that God is very negligent at best. Number three, uh, I also demonstrated this inconsistency between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Um, and that was one of the biggest challenges we faced. Um, and again, to that, Tom really simply said that, well, there was hunter-gathering societies back then, but you know, things change and morality progressed later on. Bear in mind that God determines morality. So uh, God could have prescribed the same principles back then. He could have prin prescribed the same pr principles uh, during the AD uh, period, AD 100, AD 200, 
bear in mind also that the increase in violence actually happened much later, uh, towards AD 300 onwards, and for, uh, where you have the, the, the Roman persecutions and all this, the violence and the atrocities of the Romans. This was unparalleled. You don't see that kind of violence back then in the ancient Egyptian culture. You don't see it back then during the time of Moses. You see the increase of violence, but all of a sudden, God seems to have the change of mind. So uh, Tom was not able to give any great response to that, apart from saying that, well, you know, times change and that God had his reasons for doing that and basically appealed to mystery, uh, that God has his reason, mysterious reasons for doing that. So in conclusion, uh, did Tom present any strong evidence that God existed? Yeah, I think that there were evidences that uh, he presented that would actually prove that a God existed. Did he present evidence to prove that Christianity is true? I'm afraid not. So since the topic of the debate is whether Christianity is true or not, I'm, uh, I'd have to say that uh, Tom has conceded on that one and focused instead to debate on whether God existed. So thank you very much. Um, hope this has been great. I just wanted to say one last thing. I, I, I just want to close by praying for you. I, I believe that <laughs> as a, as, as I'm going to pray for your soul. And I think I want to just make one final testable prediction that within the next minute or so, you're going to convert to Christianity. Um, <laughs> and if that happens, I guess I, I win the debate. So if that happens, would you convert to Christianity? Well, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, Tom. Time. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, over to you. You have five minutes. Oh, we're, done, we're, done. we're done. We're done. We're done. Oh, you're done. Great. Great. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. It was a brilliant. Uh, it was a brilliant session. And uh, sorry for a uh, little uh, mishaps or whatever. And uh, we have a lot of questions right now. Uh, if you guys don't mind, you guys have some time to answer some of these questions. Uh, the first question is for Tom because you played a Christian, and it's from a I'm guy. Just, I'm just yes. wondering, before we go to the question, I, I just wanted to, if, if you don't mind, just get uh, Tom's reaction and I'll share my thoughts as well on how you think that went before that. Yeah, but go ahead. Uh, I mean, how, how was that experience like? I've, I've never done this before. And, and uh, But tell me, I mean, I'm just curious how Tom felt through this. Yeah, it was really interesting. I mean, the opening part, <laughs> with, there, there's a couple odd parts where I don't just, I don't know enough about the Christian perspective. Like, should I take the libertarian free will perspective or should I go with the God, the, the Calvinist perspective here? Give me a minute, give me a minute, which is the best for the debate. So that, that part's a little odd since you got to try and like come up with your position after the fact. But it was a lot of fun. It was a really interesting topic in taking up the position and trying, especially the, the, the uh, cross, not the cross exam, the, the open discussion part that was the most interesting because you had to try to address the arguments from a, a new perspective and addressing the way the the arguments were approached is a very interesting thing to do when you're on the other side of the debate yeah yeah i mean thanks thanks for that yeah i i just wanted to say that i found playing the atheist a lot easier than i thought it was i mean it's <laughs> it's actually very easy you know, to play the atheist part i'm not saying it doesn't take sophistication but what i'm saying is i found it really fun you know that um it, it was it was really enjoyable playing the atheist. It, it actually helped me to understand what goes through the mind of an atheist. But uh, this was a fun one. Uh, I really enjoyed exchanging that with Tom. Uh, and he, I think he did. He represented the. He he really did well to continue fighting for the other side. You know, and uh, <laughs> that was really interesting. I I liked the part that when I asked him the question on. Uh, I remember asking him on <laughs> the Lord's Prayer, which is your favorite part. <laughs> <He's>, uh, <laughs> the first one. First part. <laughs> he said the first part. <laughs> it was like, Anyway, I thought that was interesting, but yeah, back to you, uh, Ezra, thanks. All right, great. Uh, shall we move on to the question? So, sure. yes, the first question is from Tom, uh, is, is for Tom. Uh, it says here, some Christians, some Christians argue that recorded paranormal activity is evidence of evil spirits, which is evidence for God's existence. Why do you Christians think this is, this is wrong? The wrong? Strong, wrong, the last word? Uh, strong. S strong. Um, is, if it makes testable predictions, that would be strong evidence. For example, if we said if evil spirits exist and we can expect them to have this kind of an effect in these conditions, then that would actually be good evidence for the evil spirits and God. Sam, do you prove the answer, Sam? Wow, he seems quiet right now. Uh, he isn't showing up on his yeah. image. Just the explain the projects thing. Well, we'll move on to the next question here. Another question for you. Uh, 
Well, we're just going to bombard you while he will wait for Sam. <laughs> yeah, um, yep. Yeah, you're back. You're back. So uh, let's go with another question here uh, once again for Tom. Um, does, does he then, this is for you, does, does this mean that you believe in a God uh, with schizophrenia or split personality that interacts with one another? Uh, I believe God is a uh, three in one. Uh, actually, he's five in one. Uh, he's just, he's parts of himself and, and he's got fingers. Wow. So it's all the same. It's just God, God is Jesus and Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is both of them combined. It's all, it's not a problem. Clearly, clearly not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, you should be addressing the Christian questions to me, but anyway, uh, but anyway, yeah, now that we have yeah. switched roles again, but anyway, <laughs> let's go with it. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you have, yeah, there's a question for you as well, Sam. Uh, yeah. Why do you atheist think it doesn't require faith to believe in the theory of evolution when you have not observed it and it requires believing what you have not seen? Actually, you should, this question should be addressed to Tom because I don't believe that. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, go for we it, Tom. We have observed it. We've literally observed it through testable predictions. We, we know for a fact that evolution is real. It's, it's the same as like we know the, the world is round. That, that level of evidence we have. Hmm. Great. Yeah, I mean, when you say when you say testable evidence for evolution, I assume you're talking about Darwinian evolution. Uh, or, or are you just talking neo, about neo Darwinian thing? evolution? Like, there's there's been many additions to just Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution was a pretty bare bones concept back in the 1800s, and we've made a lot of progress since then. So it's it's lots of new stuff we've made. Or yeah, it's not not abio not abiogenesis. I'm not talking about the origin of life. I'm talking about the diversity of species. I think that's what you were referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I think that so, for example, there are Christians that believe in um, that that uh, there, there are a good number of Christians that also believe in uh, in evolution as well. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was talking about uh, in terms of that. Do you believe like in common ancestry from one single cell? Or, yeah. Yeah, we also we also have a pretty decent amount of evidence for abiogenesis too. But that's a different topic. Right. Okay. Great. Wow. Well, whether Sam believes in evolution or not, that's another question. But um, you should phrase the, the Christian question to me. But anyway, let's let's go with the. Yeah, sure. Because everybody uh, yeah. seems to assume that you guys are still playing the same, uh, playing the other side of the role. So, anyway, uh, I'm just gonna address some questions here again. Uh, is another Christian question. Uh, I know Christianity centers on the crucifixion of Jesus, and I know there are heavy historical Christian and non-Christian writings that affirm he was crucified, but couldn't they been wrong? Over to you, Sam. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that uh, the ultimate evidence for the crucifixion, uh, to me, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is not actually in the fact um, that there are uh, you know, ancient historical sources and all that. I don't think those are the ultimate authority. For me, I think that the ultimate authority, uh, to, to borrow Tom's word, uh, is that the scripture actually makes predictions of Jesus's death, Isaiah 53. Uh, that to me, and for example, Daniel chapter 9, those passages for me would actually, and, and I, Tom and I have had this conversation on his channel before. I think those are the predictions, that's where it's coming from. And I think that the icing on this cake um, is the fact that it's also su supported by uh, the historical evidences, like, for example, T Cornelius Tacitus, um, Maraba Serapion, Pliny the Younger, um, Suetonius, um, and, and a whole list of other people, uh, not even touching Josephus yet, but yeah. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, and Eric, but this time, it, well, you can take a break for a bit, Sam, uh, because this goes to Tom. So, Tom, uh, Sam actually, uh, actually put out a claim that atheism is a belief that God doesn't exist. So the question here is, uh, why do you reject the burden of proof falls equally on you and Christians since you both must support claims? Um, things are imaginary until demonstrated otherwise. So the fact that we have no evidence to believe that God is anything but imaginary is a good reason to believe it is just imaginary. So you can reject the existence of leprechauns and Santa and unicorns and fairies, even though we don't have any evidence they don't exist. We just don't have any evidence they do exist. And so the same thing would apply to the gods, that you can believe there is no God and take the hard atheist position by just simply rejecting the fact that there's any evidence for a God. 
Great. Now, another question for Sam. Uh, it says here, I know scientists admit in the double slit experiment that electrons can be visible and invisible without changing their nature. Why do Christians use this to support the incarnation uh, in reference on John chapter 1? Uh, again, he, he, this question must be reference to Christians that do it. I've never used any analogy to, to uh, give an analogy for the incarnation. I don't think you can. Uh, part of the reason is because there are m many things going on that uh, we, we, frankly, we don't understand. For example, uh, the mystical union. How is it that these two natures dwell in harmony in one person? We don't understand that. And, and we, we are happy to call it a mystical union or the hypostatic union um, and, and basically just leave it and, and say that we don't. But we realize it's not contradictory that, you know, that God could very well, um, you know, uh, you know, Take on human form, and it's not just taking on human form, becoming man, truly man, as the creed goes, vera homo, vera deus, verily man, verily God. Uh, God can do that. If you have an all-powerful being, that doesn't contradict the laws of logic at all. God can do that. Uh, so what I would say is that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't use any analogy for it because I don't think there's anything quite like it, frankly. So, yeah. Thank you, Sam. Uh Another question for Tom. Uh, name one hospital that was solely built by an ATIS organization for the poor outside of abortion clinics. This is somewhat oh, so hospitals are built for the poor. So you can't name a hospital that's specifically built for the poor. There's lots of hospitals that are built and there's hospitals built by atheists all over the world. I don't know about atheist organizations. There's definitely atheist organizations that do humanitarian work. Uh, lots of them, especially Minnesota. Atheist is one of the biggest ones in the country that does humanitarian work and does fundraising for all kinds of different organizations. Uh, so atheists do lots of things like that. That's, and they don't build Planned Parenthood. That's not an atheist organization. Hmm. Well, it goes to another question here. Uh, it says your people of faith tend to be more philanthropic about helping the poor and needy because of empathy. How do atheists come to value any absolute truth about the innate value of another person's life? Well, that's actually false. Um, recent studies have shown that actually it's more likely that uh, the atheist cultures in different countries are actually more generous than here in America. And here in America, it's definitely true that religious organizations are more charitable because it's a fundamental part of our culture that you give money to the church. You just They, they literally just hand out a thing for you to give money to the church. So in our culture, it is the case that Christians give more money to charity, but it's actually not the case in other countries that that is true. So um, atheists do value human life. It's called humanism. We value human life actually more so than Christians in many ways. We think that it's more precious, more valuable, and we should help more people, which is why most of the more liberal policies are supported more by atheists than by Christians. We want more rights for everybody in the poor and we want them to have free money and free housing and all kinds of stuff just because we value human life. Right. Thank you, Tom. Um, well, uh, this is a question for Sam. Uh, one last question before we, we end the session today is, it says, if your God is true and we find out we are wrong as atheists, why can't we believe on the day of judgment? Why do you believe it will be too late for us after we die? No, actually, you see, so I don't believe, and I think this, I mean, that's such a great question to, to end this with. I don't believe that... Uh, what ultimately enables a person to be saved is having more confidence level in the proposition that God exists. I think that belief in God's existence is not a prerequisite. Or, I mean, it, it's, it's not what ultimately saves a person. What saves a person is a belief uh, in, in, in the Greek, pisteo, uh, which involves is far more than just having a fate or, or something. It's, it's more than that. It actually involves this relationship uh, with the person of Christ. Um, faith is something, if you, if you actually go through the Gospel of John, uh, which actually is the Gospel of faith and belief, you actually see that belief is described, in, for example, in John chapter 3 as something that God does. God does the work, bringing faith in the heart of a person. God sets, I mean, enables this person to have faith. God begins, and everyone, we, we, we have doubts. You, when you look through the Gospels, you begin to see how Jesus uh, cures the doubts of his disciples as it goes on. I actually encourage doubt all the time. Uh, when, when I speak to uh, in colleges and universities, 
I encourage them to doubt, to ask those hard questions. Um, but ultimately, here's the fundamental difference. Salvation is in this relationship, this knowledge with God. And that's what Jesus says in John chapter 17, 3. Eternal life is knowing you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, your son. The only way you can know God is through the person of Jesus Christ who reveals God perfectly. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's not as if you go on the last day. I mean, at the end of the day, the Bible says in Philippians 2, every knee is going to bow one day and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. That doesn't save people. Uh, what ultimately saves people is having that relationship with God and basically getting to know God here on earth. That's already, we are living in that eternal life right now. That's, that's the Christian belief. Uh, and so this idea of if you only had a little bit more faith, you would meet the requirement for heaven. Is It's kind of like a caricature, which is inaccurate to say the least. Uh, we're talking about having a relationship with a person here. Uh, it's more than just, you know, just having confidence levels fluctuating up and down. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that question came up. So eternal life essentially is this knowledge and this relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and we look through the gospel of John to summarize what I said. God does the work. God invites the person. Jesus says in John chapter six, I believe, no one comes to me unless God, the father, I mean, unless the father who sent me draws them to me and I will raise them to life on the last day. God does the work of drawing. God does the work of raising to life on the last day. So if, if you're out there and you have hope, if, if you're, you're having doubts, um, that's okay. I believe that God can give faith in the midst of doubts. Yeah. So, um, and on the other hand, it's not as if you have to wait and, you know, just have a little bit more confidence in God and you'll make it to heaven. That's not quite it. Uh, you've got to understand what the gospel is. You've got to understand and uh, look through the life of Jesus to understand that uh, the context in which the scripture tells us, you know, how we were at risk in the father's hands. We, I wish we had, I mean, maybe in another session, I'll talk about some of my own answers to my own objections. Maybe it might be fun to get Tom back on as well again uh, to do that for his side as well. Uh, but one of the things that I believe is that uh, humanity uh, is in danger of being judged by God because of its outright rebellion against God. But God in his mercy sends his son Jesus to save us. Salvation is not just believing that it's having that relationship. You're entering into this new relationship with God and experiencing eternal life. So this idea of just confidence level is just, uh, it's not quite an accurate depiction of the Christian faith. Great. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you as well for Tom. And thank, uh, thank you for being here. And also for our viewers, thank you so much for uh, sending our questions and for being with us uh, for the past uh, one hour and a half. And yes, if you have any more questions, just put it down on the comment box and um, we'll do our best to reply to all the questions. And, and of course, we'll be sending some questions uh, to Tom as well. If you have any questions for Tom, <clears throat> and um, that's Tom, what Tom is active. Tom is very active in the, <laughs> oh, in yes, the comment yes. section. <laughs> Tom is always active, exactly. And Tom runs a YouTube channel called T Jump. You can check him out as well. Uh, he write, he does a lot of debates. Uh, he gives out a lot of opinions uh, on science, religion, um, and philosophy. And uh, we just want to give a special thanks to our team uh, back in KL, um, Rubina, and Marcus. Thank you so much. Uh, for your time and your effort in making this happen along with me. Uh, once again, on behalf of Explain Apologetics and on behalf of Tom Jump, um, we're signing out. And my name is Ezra. 